So the crew has encountered a UFO. Aliens. Yeah, don't get your hopes up, Rimmer. Whoever or whatever made this thing had access to a technology far in advance of our own. They split up so they can cover more ground, because that's always a good idea. I'm not teaming up with him. Except that Rimmer doesn't want to go with the cat. You only look after number one, you're narcissistic and you're self-obsessed. He just listed all my best features. This bit gets reused in the Can't Smeg, Won't Smeg special a few years later, but with the roles reversed. I guess I'll have to cover that once I get to that point in the series. This is one of those scenes that's shot like a horror movie. Anyway, Rimmer and Crichton found a member of the crew. Apparently it fell through Rimmer and scared the crap out of him. Literally, going by what Crichton says. I believe he's just discovered what shirt tails are for. Again, Rimmer's a hologram, so not sure how that works, but whatever. I guess they told us about this rather than showing us, because this is a low-budget show and they probably couldn't show an object passing through Rimmer like that convincingly. Yeah, they kind of sort of pulled it off in season one, but not very well, and the show has higher standards than it used to. So Lister and Kat go into a room with a console panel, which Kat immediately starts messing with. Earlier, he kept shorting out the power with his hairdryer. He is just a complete pain in the ass in this one. Brilliant! I'm, I'm, I'm trapped! Get me out of this thing! What the smeg is that? Back to Crichton and Rimmer, we get to see the messed up looking dead crew member they talked about. It turns out that it was once human, but was mutated somehow. Language trace completed. Back to Lister and Cat. Gene sample accepted and cloned. Ooh, stupidity and arrogance is a bad combination. Lister wants Cat to stop and get Crichton, but Cat insists he can figure it out. Relax, would you? I know what I'm doing. That look on his face says otherwise. Sequence complete. And now Lister is a chicken. Best guess? Some kind of DNA modifier. Crichton compares DNA to a computer program and explains that this computer basically rewrites the program. So this machine can transform any living thing into any other living thing by altering its molecular structure. Precisely. Try not to enjoy this so much, Rimmer. <laughs> it's incredible, it really is him. Look, it's even got his little beer gut. Crichton thinks he can change it back. Well, that's closer. At least he's a mammal now. So Crichton asks Cat what exactly happened, so Cat tries to show him. And this boy said, Transmogrification sequence engaged. Right! The whole crew is going to be a menagerie at this rate. The machine can only operate on organic life. I am mineral and therefore immune. Wait a minute. No. My brain is part organic. So Crichton's technically a cyborg? Huh. Engage panic circuits. Panic circuits engaged. Anyway, Cat somehow presses the right combination to revert Lister human again. Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. So he does the same with Crichton, and now... My heavens. I'm human. Yeah, that just happened. And once again, we get to see Robert Llewellyn without makeup, only this time he's still Crichton. Breakfast, my very first meal. Boiled chicken ovulations. Delicious. Lister goes to see him and Crichton has some interesting questions about how humans function. My optical system doesn't appear to have a zoom function. How do you bring a small object into sharp focus? Well, you just move your head closer to the object. Now, then, uh, my, my nipples don't work. That sounds hilarious out of context. Even in context, it's pretty goofy. When I was a mechanoid, the left nipple nut was used mainly to uh, pick up shortwave radio transmissions. No matter how hard I twiddle it, I can't seem to pick up Jazz FM. Human nipples don't do that, Christ. Try not to be distracted by the lady in the audience with a squeaky laugh. <laughs> Christ, we eat and sleep. That's our way of recharging. And now Crichton has an especially delicate question. Well, I want to talk to you about my penis. <laughs> that smirk is so convincing. First time I saw this, I thought Craig Charles was corpsing. I knew it, you've gone straight into smirk mode. Speaking of natural reactions... <laughs> well? Apparently the prop department had Robert Llewellyn hand Craig Charles an actual dick pic and didn't tell him about it ahead of time. So that's why his reaction is so realistic. I want to know, is that normal? What, taking photographs of it and showing it to your mates? Is, but is it supposed to look like that? Yeah, dicks are meant to be functional and not pretty. Crichton yes. kind of found that out the hard way. Are you seriously telling me there were choices and someone said, Huh, that's the shape we're looking for, the last chicken in the shop look. And it's about to get even more awkward. Now why do you suppose that happened? What were you thinking of at the time? I was just idly flicking through an electrical appliance catalog. I came across the section on super deluxe vacuum cleaners and suddenly my underpants elastic was catapulted across the medical bay. 
So this brings up a dichotomy where Crichton is physically human but still has the mind of a robot, and Lister thinks that's just unnatural and wrong. I think he's jumping to that conclusion a bit quickly, and maybe a simple adjustment period would have taken care of that. Or hell, he could have just been someone who looks human but has the attitude of something else, kind of like Cat. There have certainly been weirder things on this show, but oh well. Also... No vacuum cleaner should give a human being a double Polaroid! Yeah, this show just invented a new euphemism for erection. How many mechanoids does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. Twelve. And you know why? Why? Because they're so stupid! To be fair though, Crichton is being kind of insufferable. The greatest joke! <laughs> if he ever offers to show you his photo collection, my advice is decline politely. I'm not saying that Lister doesn't have a good point, though. Generally, that you shouldn't try to be something that you're not. You've got to stay true to what you are. Meanwhile, Rimmer is trying to clone himself from some dandruff from an old brush so that he can have a physical body again. And he thinks Lister is being a paranoid technophobe and that, and that being human is the best thing that ever could have happened to Crichton. What about the dude with three heads? What happened to him? Well, he abused it. Lister argues that being human isn't necessarily all that great. Kachansky just finished with me and I was feeling really pony. It went by so fast I almost missed it, but that's the point where they retconned Lister's relationship with Kachansky. Originally he had barely had any interaction with her, and now it's that they fooled around for a bit but it didn't work out. So I saw this squiddle climbing up and down its tree collecting nuts. And it stopped and it looked at me. And I thought, you lucky little sod. You've got no woman's trouble, so you'll never feel as bad as I feel now. And at that moment, I mean, for a split second, I would have given anything. Anything to swap places with them? So, Lister, what are you telling us? You're a closet squirrel? Behind closed doors, you parade up and down with a strap-on bushy tail, calling yourself Nutkin? Thanks for the visual, Rimmer. Being human sometimes isn't all it's cracked up to be. This is the kind of debate where neither side is completely right or wrong. On one hand, you can't ignore the usefulness of advanced technology, but on the other, someone will always misuse it. The best place to be is somewhere in the middle. Meanwhile, apparently Crichton is wearing random cast-offs from Cat's closet. Seriously, most of these are articles of clothing I could see Cat wearing, just not together. The most wonderful thing has happened. We found this machine and it's made me human. Anyway, he goes to his supply closet to talk to his spare heads. Aren't you happy for me? I'm not a mechanoid. I'm not second class anymore. They are not too happy with him. You came into this world as a mechanoid, and a mechanoid you always be. I don't have to take this from you. I'm a human. Shut your stupid flat head. I bet he's always wanted to say that to someone else. I don't believe you just said that. I think you should leave now, Crichton. There's nothing more to say. And what about you, spare hand one? How do you feel? Figures. Afterwards, Crichton confesses to Lister that he's having trouble dealing with his emotions and he's not as happy as he feels like he should be. I've done the most terrible thing. I've hurt my own kind. I've made fun of those closest to me. I've been a complete and total Polaroid head. There it is again. I love this episode. I did something similar once. It turns out that Lister knows what he's talking about because he sold out once too. Once, many years ago, I went into a wine bar. That's it? You went into a wine bar? Okay, keep it down, keep it down. Well, what's so bad about going into a... WB? That means I was a class traitor. Oh, you Brits in your social classes. God almighty, who knows where it could have ended? Next thing you know, I'm playing squash every Tuesday night with a bloke called Gerald. So Crichton has decided he wants to be a mechanoid again, so they go back to the vessel. But to make sure they know what they're doing, they test it out on Lister's Vindaloo first. <laughs> But because this is Red Dwarf, the results are horrific. You've created the mutton vindaloo beast. Half man, half extra Indian curry. I love that there's Indian music playing in the background. Lister points out that this isn't the first time he's been attacked by Indian food. That's right, you were attacked by a killer shami kebab. How can the same smeg happen to the same guy twice? Because Red Dwarf. Twice! So Lister has an idea that involves going back to the DNA machine. Nice one, Lister. I think I somehow missed that on previous viewings. Tamians were superhuman. Man plus. Metamorphosis is complete. So Lister is now a tiny half Robocop. Can't help but notice that the bazookoid got smaller, too. I can't keep up, I'm naked! Because Lister didn't talk funny enough already. So Lister stumbles onto the creature's weakness. Of course, lager. The only thing that can kill a vindaloo. I guess the joke is that beer goes with curry. Smile, you son of a- Has anyone got a pop of 
on the size of Lake Michigan? Ew. <laughs> this guy's pure class. Sounds like something I would say. And so ends DNA. This is a great episode, probably one of my favorites. Though I am kind of surprised that they went in such an extreme direction with Crichton only one season after he became a regular on the show. Only season four and he's already been human. And so far there are six more seasons to go. Compare that to data from Star Trek TNG who didn't even fully develop emotions until after the TV series ended. Hard to imagine that there'd be much left to go with Crichton's character after that, but they managed just fine. This is far from being the last Crichton episode. Speaking of which, it's always fun seeing Robert Llewellyn out of makeup. He's one of those actors whose face seems to be made out of rubber, like Jim Carrey. Even with the makeup on, Crichton is pretty expressive, but without it, it's even more so. The things this guy can do with his face is incredible. I've already talked about Lister's view of this situation and how that's basically the idea the story is trying to get across. If I had to complain about something, it's that maybe it could have been a bit more subtle about it, at least in the beginning. Like I said, Lister jumps to the conclusion that Crichton being human is unnatural and wrong almost immediately. It almost makes him come across as judgmental or something. I just feel that maybe he could have eased into that opinion a bit more slowly. Then again, the episode was half over by then, so maybe there just wasn't time for that. Hell, I know I'm nitpicking. For an episode that ends with a tiny half Robocop Lister fighting a curry monster with beer, it's actually pretty deep and well thought out overall. Also, the more I think about it, the more I think this episode is probably an allegory for the aforementioned separation of social classes in Britain, and I will admit that some of that is probably lost on me. Next up is Justice. See you then. What was it like being a hamster? It was better than being a chicken. I mean, you seen the size of an egg. You seen the size of a chicken's bum. I was trying to say in chicken talk, for God's sake, give me an epidural.